On this week in Enterprise Tech, we talk about 5G and how the 24 gigahertz spectrum may be disrupting weather forecasting. I was wondering what was doing that. Plus, Curtis talks about updating your older versions of your OSs. And Brian Curtis and I talk with David Friend, CEO of Wasabi, about disruptive technology and cloud storage services. Twilight on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyat. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 342, recorded May 17th, 2019. Wasabi, the Walmart of storage. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by LastPass, the number one most preferred password manager. Just remember your master password and LastPass remembers the rest. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. And by Pulseway, the ridiculously cool IT management software that lets you remotely monitor and control IT systems from any device. It's enabling busy admins to fix issues on the go and be more productive. Try it free for 14 days at Pulseway.com slash twit. And by LinkedIn Talent Solutions. Find the right people for your business this year at LinkedIn.com slash this week and get $50 off your first job post. Welcome to Twyat This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Moresk, your guide to this big world of the enterprise, but I definitely can't guide you by myself. I need some help from some of the top enterprise tech professionals in the industry, starting out with our very own geek in paradise, Mr. Brian Chi, Director of Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu. Chibert, great to have you back. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. I'm a little sore. I've been climbing up and down ladders, putting in some new security cameras. Axis has this really cute one that's actually five camera lenses kind of along the equator of a globe, and it stitches them together, and it's amazing. Uh, Boy, oh, boy. (laughs) (laughs) Always the fun stuff. Always fun. Talking about doing something fun, Curtis, Brian, Mr. Curtis Franklin, Senior Editor at Dark Reading. Curtis, you're doing some traveling pretty soon. Welcome back. Thank you so much. It's great to be here uh, calling in from the swamp. Yeah, I will be going to some place that's definitely not swamp-like. Uh, heading out later this weekend for Las Vegas. I'll be there for Interop 2019 all next week. I uh, hope that folks will follow me on the various social networks. Or if they're going to be at the conference, look me up. I'm going to be taking part in a number of uh conference sessions. I'm also going to be hanging around the demo network. Uh, Should be a great time out in the desert. Fantastic. Well, I'll definitely have to live vicariously through you because it's raining here and I need a little bit of sunshine. But uh, talk about sunshine. We do have some really great. We have a great show for you today. Definitely, definitely great show. We we have we're going to talk a little bit about five G spectrums and how they might be affecting some critical services that are happening out there. Plus, we have a great guest, David Friend, CEO of Wasabi. He's going to talk a little bit about modern cloud storage. But we, before we get into all that goodness, let's go ahead and jump into this week's blips. Now, we've heard of exploits coming from Intel processors in the past, but if you remember, we talked about speculative execution, which actually means that your CPU tries to think ahead of time on what data it may or may not need, and the processor actually loads it before you actually need it. Well, we've actually heard of some of the patchable flaws that have happened here, but there seems to be a set of new ones that might be the worst of them all. Found by a coalition of researchers from University of Michigan, the University of Adelaide, and others, including security firms in Bitdefender and Oracle, there are four new flaws related to this CPU technology, which is the speculative execution. Now, names given to the flaw range are Zombieland, Fallout, Riddle, or Rogue in-flight data load, but Intel likes to just dumb it down a little bit and call it Microarchitectural Data Sampling, or MDS. <laughs> now, you must be thinking, what does this flaw do, and how does it exploit me, and, and, and how does it give data to attackers? Well, like on the other side of the channel, like other side channel attacks, 
An exploit of this technology may flaw, may actually, may actually cause, allow, or allow hackers to obtain information that was otherwise deemed secure. And had it been run through the CPU's speculative execution processes, it could have been. But while Meltdown reads sensitive information that's been stored in memory due to speculative execution functions on Intel CPUs, MDX actually attacks or reads the data of the CPU on various buffers. Now, both between threads and on the CPU cache and others, the researchers say that this flaw can be used to siphon data from the CPU at the rate that the approach actually approaches real time, which means that it could be selectively pull information that it deems important, whether it's password information or websites the user is visiting at any moment in the attack. It's all fair game. Now, Intel has said that the significant software changes will need be needed to harden the systems against this exploit, not only from themselves, but other operating system vendors and third-party app creators will need to also do work here. One of the most proposed solutions is that every time a processor would switch from, third, from a third-party app to another, from Windows processor to a third-party app, or even less trusted Windows processes to even more trusted ones, the buffers have to be cleared or overwritten. Now, fixes are not without prompt performance compromises. But if this is news proves anything else, is that everything else is fair game to attackers these days. So ensure you're up to date on your latest patches, even the CPU ones. Well, after a series of malware attacks earlier this month, code repository repositories have decided to work together for better security. During the May 2nd ransomware attack on certain of their users, Popular repository service providers at Lassian, GitHub, and GitLab all rush to analyze the origins of the incident and help their users recover. As part of the response, the security teams at the three companies began to share data on the attacks and how the attackers operated. The action was so effective that the three organizations have decided to make the sharing permanent. As an example of the ongoing collaboration, the companies will explicitly search for files stored in their user repositories that may contain credentials to the other service. While this is the first time a developer-focused group is formed to share security information, sharing information on threats between competitors has become an increasing norm rather than an exception. Other industries have created information sharing and analysis centers, or ISACs, to do just this thing. Now, for the repository companies, a shared Slack channel is the primary mechanism for sharing the information so far. More mechanisms may be coming. In addition to their collaboration, the three repository firms all urge developers to turn on two-factor authentication for their repositories, a defensive measure that would have absolutely prevented the May 2nd ransomware attack. Well... Just as a quickie, I just want to mention that Atlassian is a sponsor of Twit TV, and we thank them for their um, support. Well, my blip talks about Google warning about their Titan security keys can be hijacked by nearby hackers. Google is warning that the Bluetooth low energy version of the Titan security key it sells for two-factor authentication can be hijacked by nearby attackers and the company is advising users to get a free replacement device that fixes the vulnerability. A misconception in the key's Bluetooth pairing protocols makes it possible for attackers within 30 feet to either communicate with the key or with the device it's paired with. Google Cloud Pro Product Manager Christian Brand wrote in a post published this last Wednesday, quote, the attack described by Brand, invo well, involves hijacking the pairing process when an attacker within 30 feet. Quote, when, you, when you're trying to sign into an account on your device, you are normally asked to press the button on your BLE security key to activate it. An attacker in close physical proximity at that moment in time can potentially connect their own device to your affected security key before your own device connects. In this set of circumstances, the attacker could sign into your account using their own device if the attacker somehow uh, already attained your username and password and could time these events exactly. Yeah, big if. Before you can use your security key, it must be paired to your device. Once paired, an attacker in close proximity to you could use their device to masquerade as your affected security key and connect to your device at the moment you're asked to press the button on your key. After that, they could attempt to change their device to appear as a Bluetooth keyboard or mouse and potentially take actions on your device. 
For the account takeover to succeed, the attacker would also have to know the target's username and password. I, for one, am seriously bummed, and I guess I'll be asking for a replacement for my unit as soon as possible. And you know what? I almost forgot. Slack is also a Twit sponsor, and we want to thank them for their support of show material like This Week in Enterprise Technology. Thanks, Cheaper. Now, if you remember months back, ATT was found selling location data to other third-party organizations. That was a big controversy, and the FCC got involved. However, at t seems to be standing its ground. Now, in the latest letter made public this week, at t saying that the practices of selling this data was technically legal because it did not involve the type of data that the FCC prohibits carriers from selling without user consent. Now, most carriers have stated they will stop sharing this data, but it seems that data streams are still flowing in some cases. And what is being claimed is that, and I quote, the fault lies within its partners for not handling the data appropriately and deleting it when necessary, and lawmakers have applied increased pressure on the companies to follow through on the prom promise to make, to take action and the end agreements. Now, you might be wondering what kind of wordsmith or technical spin at t might be saying about the data here. Well, here it goes. Don't shoot the messenger here. Now, at t is saying that the data is legal to share because technically it is a GPS data, A-GPS data, which is gathered by, for a company for claims for use by both emergency services for GPS based services like ride hauling apps and is not under the same umbrella as the data the FCC prohibits carriers from selling or data stored in what's known as National Emergency Address Database or NEED. Now, at t says NEED data can be can, can and is more granular and can use Wi-Fi and Bluetooth data to pinpoint indoor locations, whereas A-GPS is more general. Now, with when bounty hunter companies like Zumigo and Microbill can use the AGD GPS data to pinpoint targets, to me, it's it's the same data. Now, this letter might have uh, had a reverse effect on at t which what they wanted it to happen, because it's re-sparking interest from the SEC and from the public on this particular topic. Now, let's just see what kind of things happen in the near future that it could f affect their bottom line. Well, just when you thought encryption was the answer, uh, hackers have reached the same conclusion. Researchers at Akamai say that online attackers are trying to obscure their encrypted traffic in an attempt to evade detection using a technique known as cipher stunting. The researchers found that the number of variations of the initial handshake request, which is known as the client hello packet, has recently exploded from the usual thousands of variants found in August 2018 to more than a billion variants in February. Now, while variations could be due to legitimate software behavior or some sort of software defect, the most likely explanation is that attackers are attempting to evade detection or appear like a large number of different systems. The team was able to deduce that a Java-based tool was being used to create most of the variants that they're seeing. Because SSL and TLS are so popular, many companies use fingerprinting of those as one of the techniques to classify traffic. Much of the randomization occurred on traffic attempting to use login credentials stolen from other sites to take over accounts. But there's some good news. Because the explosion of random fingerprints may mean that defenders will have problems classifying specific malware, but they should still be able to detect TLS encryption requests that are behaving badly. Now, this blip, sadly, we can't do anything about, but I'm hoping that the FAA will. So just about every aircraft that has flown over the last 50 years be it a single-engine Cessna or a 600-seat jumbo jet, is aided by radios to safely land at airports. These instrument landing systems, ILS, are considered precision approach systems because unlike GPS and other navigation systems, they provide crucial real-time guidance about both the plane's horizontal alignment with the runway and its vertical angle of descent. In many settings, particularly during foggy or rainy nighttime landings, this radio-based navigation is a primary means for ensuring planes touch down at the start of run the runway and on its centerline. 
Like many technologies built in the early decades, the ILS was never designed to be secure from hacking. Radio signals, for instance, aren't encrypted or authenticated. Instead, pilots simply assume that the tones their radio-based navigation systems receive on a runway's publicly assigned frequency are legitimate signals broadcast by the airport operator. This lack of security hasn't been much of a concern over the years, largely because the cost and difficulty of spoofing malicious radio signals made attacks infeasible. Now researchers have designed a low-cost hack that raises questions about the security of ILS, which is used at virtually every civilian airport throughout the industrialized world. Using a $600 uh, software-defined radio, the researchers can spoof airport signals in a way that causes a pilot's navigation instruments to falsely indicate a plane is off course. Normal training will call for the pilot to adjust the plane's descent rate or alignment accordingly and create, a poten and create a potential accident as a result. One attack technique is for spoofing signals to indicate that a plane's angle of descent is more gradual than it actually is. The spoofed message would generate what is sometimes called a fly-down signal that instructs the pilot to steepen the angle of descent, possibly causing the aircraft to touch the ground before reaching the start of the runway. This is truly tragic and means that the FAA controllers are going to need to be extra vigilant to check to see if the plane is off the ILS glide path. It also seems to indicate that maybe this system is overdue for an upgrade. Now, you might have heard of semantic analysis of your text, which is where they do uh, analysis and they say, hey, to determine your, what you're feeling when you actually wrote something. Well, what if I told you that Google's new prototype for its AI translator can now translate your speech, but also translate your tone when you said it as well? Now, dubbed Translatron, it uses a pictogram data or detailed visualizations of sound to process the translation and actually not raw audio to translate it. Essentially what that means is that you, in order to translate speech from one language to another, it uses pictures instead of audio. Mind blown. According to Google, this system avoids dividing the task of translation into separate stages, providing a few advantages over cascaded systems, included, including faster inference speeds, naturally avoiding compounding errors between recognition and translation, and making it straightforward to retain the voice of the original speaker after translation, and also offering better handling of words that did not need to be translated. Now, the emergence of end-to-end -end models on speech translation started back in 2016 when researchers basically demonstrated the feasibility of using these single sequence to sequence models for to speech to text. However, this real this is the real first prototype to show how good it could be. I don't know about you, but it seems in the near future that expression and emotion will less likely to be lost in translation. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But before we get to the bites, I want to thank a really great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Last pass. Now, people have their favorite tool that saves them time and money. And for me, that is LastPass. I love LastPass. I use it on every one of my devices. I'm going to guess that you've probably heard of it before, but it really is my favorite tool. If you have a username and password for every site you go to, every site, especially the ones that are most important to you, like financial sites, business sites, social networking, emailing. For me, it's five different banks. I'm supposed to remember a different username and password for every one of them. Well, it becomes a lot easier to manage with LastPass. It basically, LastPass automatically remembers and fills your passwords in anytime, anywhere, whether you're on your computer, your mobile device. All you have to do is remember that LastPass master password and LastPass remembers the rest. Now, I got hooked on it when I started using it on my desktop. I actually use it as a browser extension and it fills in my passwords for me. But now I use it on all my devices. I use it on my my web browsers, Chrome, Edge, Firefox, Opera, and more. Plus, it works great on Android and iOS it really gives you peace of mind here that your data is not only encrypted, but it's decrypted on the device level, which means the data stored in your vault is actually kept secret, even from LastPass. So that's, it's really kind of a good peace of mind there. Now, I remember the day I was called to work and my family said, hey, I need this password. I need to make a payment. Do you remember it? Well, of course, I didn't remember it. So I went over to open the LastPass vault with my master password and bam, I could give them that password. They were able to make that payment. 
save me time, save me money. Now, I'm actually talking about my personal experience with LastPass, but there's also LastPass families that actually helps the entire family as well as there's LastPass works amazing for enterprise too. Now, enterprises are always battling people trying to breach their networks. Check out this piece of data. Over 81% of breaches are caused by weak or reused passwords. Plus, that same survey says that 32% of employees share passwords with others. Well, LastPass makes it easy to use. You can use unique random passwords that your employees don't have to remember or write down. Every employee has their own secure vault for managing accessing passwords. Now, in large organizations, people have to share them. Well, that's what we don't want to pass sticky notes around because that doesn't work. It's really the last straw here. So what do, what can we do? Well, LastPass makes it easy for you to share those passwords. Plus, it allows complete customization around uh, restricting access on specific devices, devices and locations and enabling pass reset and more. Now, there's also offers multi-factor auth. They have an authenticator that blocks attackers and they want to ensure that they have the identity of that assessor. Plus, there's a raise some more eyebrows here. IT admins might really find this cool is that there's active directory integration. Employees can log in to LastPass with their AD credentials so that they can truly have just one password to remember the rest. Now, for me, it just makes it so I don't really have to remember a single password, just my AD one. In fact, I can log in with my face to AD. Now, even that, um, even that authenticator really helps here. Now, also LastPass Enterprise has can, can you configure over a hundred policies, access security reports, create shared folders. You can share all types of things uh, and secure all types of things: database logins, SSH keys, licenses, and more. I can honestly tell you, it it really is my favorite tool. It really is. It's one that's ingrained in my daily life now. I use it every day, all the time. Protect yourself and your business with LastPass, the number one most preferred password manager, trusted by over forty. 3,000 businesses. Join over 13.5 million people who have been signed up for LastPass and are loving and trusting it. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you. That's lastpass.com slash twit. And we thank LastPass for their support in this week in enterprise tech. Well, let's go ahead and jump into the bites. Now, we've all heard about the 5G race going on between mobile carriers, but it seems that there might be a minor technical glitch that's causing wrongdoing in that frequency spectrum that they're using. Now, in a recent U.S. Navy memo to the FCC, they urged them to avoid issuing new spectrum licenses for 5G to, carry wi to wireless carriers because it could start to harm weather forecasting now titled operational impacts from potential loss of NOAA or, or mini uh, and, and, and NASA meteorology and oceanic group satellite data resulting from the FCC spectrum auction for 5g now that's a pretty long title but it's basically just saying that it talks about partial to complete loss of data and measurements due to to this issue. Now, the problem could affect Navy and Marine Corps forecasts of tropical cyclones as well as rain, ice, and snow. Now, until the SEC approves the passive ban protection limits that the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, and National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, determine are necessary to protect critical satellite based measurements of atmospheric water, vapor, and so on, it seems that this issue will still continue. Okay, I want to throw it over to you guys because this just seems kind of way out of whack. I'll start with you, Chibert. Like, how does this happen? Like, how did the FCC not know this and not protect this? Uh, Ajit Pai is asleep at the wheel and he probably wasn't listening to his technical people. Um, this is not something that has been magically appeared in a buried report. This has been out for quite a while. Um, the RF spectrum is very, very well mapped out. And um, for the FCC people to go and say, oh, it caught us by surprise is a load of hooey. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, we've, there's some awful, hey, I have a poster on my wall of the RF spectrum map that I got from Tektronix Corporation. And the NOAA radio is clearly marked on that band. It's like, if it's that public, how could they have missed it? I'm sorry. You know, this is, this should have been done in due diligence before they started up on trying to sell those um, bands. I think someone just had dollar signs in their eyes and didn't do their due diligence. 
<laughs> I definitely agree here. I, I want to throw it over to Kurt here, though, because even though we know, you know, not to poke a little bit fun at weather people, but even though we know the weather forecasting are not always that great, to think that the FCC would not have seen this and said, oh, immediately when we were made known of this, we, we will stop. There hasn't been anything about that anywhere, about them saying they're going to stop. How does this affect um, well, one, how does this affect the FCC? I mean, sorry, the 5G adoption. And two, why, why do you think the FCC hasn't done anything here? Well, I think that what we're seeing now is a bunch of competing agendas. Um, and they include, but are not limited to, uh, the thing that, that Chiebert just mentioned, the fact that we do have lots and lots of dollar signs in play with all of this. 5G is huge and is um, really seen by many people as being the key to North America's next great move forward in the internet bandwidth wars. Uh, we have notoriously been behind much of the rest of the world for most of our consumer internet history, this is seen as a chance to ultimately catch up, even though, as we've discussed here on the show, uh, the plans by the major carriers uh, are for a leisurely rollout of, of genuine 5G. The other thing is something that, that many people don't realize. There has been a move among some legislators from one political party um, to put an end to federal weather forecasting. Uh, they don't like the idea that NOAA is projecting the weather when that could be done something that's done by private companies for profit. And so I suspect, given the current administration, and, and let me say right now, this is purest speculation, but philosophically, the notion that a profit-making venture, that around 5G, could interfere with something that they see as an illegitimate function of government, NOAA's weather forecasting, um, wouldn't cause them a whole lot of lost sleep. Now, the fact that there really aren't a lot of, of, of other options for getting accurate weather forecasts is, is a small detail. But I, I think that what you have is a bunch of different philosophical and political issues all coming together with a nice, thick, glossy icing of, uh, of money. And it means that in terms of the people who truly care and are responsible for making the regulations, they're just fine with the way this is working out. Now, Cheaper, this is the 24 gigahertz spectrum. What about this? Is, is it, what is actually happening here? Is there, is there just a block of the frequency? Like what's, what's the technology issue going on here? The, the issue isn't, well, 24 gigahertz is, is a direct interference. And that's, in my mind, what the FCC is supposed to try and avoid. Um, but the biggest issue is um, power. Um, they're talking about bleed over between the NOAA system and um, the 24 gigahertz. So if you start pumping more and more power into, a 20, into these microcells for 5G, they're going to start going and bleeding over into what NOAA uses to go and measure the water vapor in the air. Now, <clears throat> let's go put this in perspective. Say, for instance, the FCC continues to be asleep at the wheel and the administration gets their wish and NOAA stops doing this kind of predictions. <clears throat> well, what would happen if, say, over the Atlantic, a giant mass of water vapor, a.k.a. clouds, big clouds with lots and lots of water in them, a.k.a. storm clouds, um, were going unseen and rolled over, say, the Gulf Coast, say, New Orleans, and dumped, say, I don't know, 20 or 30 inches of rain in 20, 24 hours? What do you think the general populace is going to say? Why, you know, why couldn't we predict? Well, we could, but we got shut down by the FCC. You know, that's that's the danger I'm seeing. Um, sadly, I, I'm agreement, you know, Eric Duckman actually made a comment. The National Weather Service forecasts are more accurate than the Weather Channel ones uh, for here, wherever here is. Um, 
considering there's 2,500 miles of nothing around the Hawaiian Island chain, uh, we live and die by those National Weather Service satellites because otherwise we would never, ever see the giant storms that come rolling over the island chain on a really regular basis. And if we had a chance to see it ahead of time, we can prepare for it. But if NOAA couldn't do it because of some misguided pissing match with the FCC, um, we could definitely have a fairly large loss of life in Hawaii and other places around the globe. Well, thanks, Chibert. Well, I do want to jump, throw it over to Kurt. Kurt, you want, we can talk a little bit about uh, patching older systems here, right? Well, we are. And um, we could put this under the label, why won't some older systems just go ahead and gracefully shuffle off this mortal coil. <laughs> this has been brought to, to higher prominence in the, the last week or two because Microsoft has decided to patch unsupported machines for a, a um, flaw 2019-0708 that's considered critical and affects Windows XP, 2003, and other older versions of Windows that are still running in some enterprises. Now, some background on this. This is a flaw in a remote code execution bug. It, 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 it is an RCE, a remote code execution bug. And it is a flaw in Windows Remote Desktop Services, or RDS. This is what used to be known as terminal services. And it affects a number of in-support and out-of-support versions of Windows. Microsoft says that this flaw, which has not been exploited in the wild so far as they know, could be weaponized as a worm if someone did exploit it. So it's a pre-authentication flaw and requires absolutely no interaction. In, in other words, there are lots of very good reasons for them to patch this. Now, here's something that's interesting. Microsoft and other technology companies typically decide that after several years, when several ver new generations of software have, have come out, that older versions go out of support. They're out of date. There will no longer be patches, updates, modifications, anything like that coming from the company. As I said, there are lots of really good and, and sensible reasons to do this. But because there are an awful lot of systems still out there, largely on enterprise desktops running Windows XP, Windows 2003, and to be brutally honest, even older versions of Windows, Microsoft did the right thing and released the update to take care of this issue. Now, after Microsoft disclosed the flaw, Alert Logic, a company that is a software uh, or a, a security company, their researchers scanned more than 4,000 customer sites to determine which were vulnerable. What they found was that 61% of the workloads were running Windows 7 or Windows 2008. And a little over 2% were running Windows XP and 2003. Put them together and they mean that nearly two-thirds of all the businesses they scanned are using older or unsupported versions of Windows. So why is this true? There are several reasons. One is that there are old, com uh, smaller companies out there who have these older systems and decide, you know what? For our purposes, they work just fine. If all you're doing is some local word processing, if perhaps you have your accounting system that's running on a legacy version of Excel, if it works and your employees are trained to use it, it just keeps working. It costs money to update, both in terms of the initial outlay and retraining employees. So a lot of smaller companies that frankly don't have a lot of money to spend 
decide that they're just going to run these systems until the wheels fall off. Now, for other companies, and this is especially true for industrial control systems, patching can be very difficult because they are running critical software that is dependent upon specific system calls, specific functions, specific utilities within specific versions of the operating system. They have no guarantee that a, a newer version of the operating system will support their applications. And I have to say, in many cases, those applications were written by someone who either worked for a company that's no longer in business or the individual is no longer working for the company or is even available. So it becomes truly critical for them to be able to continue working with these older legacy versions of the operating system. In the meantime, the vulnerabilities pile up, the patches get fewer and fewer, and therefore the security risk grows almost by the day. So, Lou, I, I want to turn to you with this first question. And and while we know that, that you tend to work heavily with a specific operating system and group of, of applications, I'd, I'd like to get you to expand on that just a little bit. Why is it so hard to write applications that work across multiple generations of an operating system? So that is a very loaded question. Uh, but to put it simply, um, operating systems obviously have to change the way they do things. They have to go grow with the growing times with new hardware to support new hardware capabilities. We just talked about Intel's uh, different caching mechanisms and so on that they need to handle. Operating systems need to understand that. And sometimes older applications don't just, just don't support it. But Windows has actually done a very interesting thing. Over the last decade and or more, they've done this thing where they actually offer compatibility. They offer ways for developers to keep their applications running, whether it's a Windows 7 application on Windows 10 or so on and so forth, to run by offering abstraction layers. They don't break. They try not to break things. They try to leave them there, but they offer newer technology, newer ways to do things under these abstraction layers that offer more secure ways of doing things, even though they keep the same interfaces and the same things that applications need to, to work. Now, there are some scenarios where some applications used to use direct driver access or so on, and those things might no longer work unless you give consent to them and so on. But most of the time, apps tend to work across 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 OSs. Now, there are some specific applications that use maybe unsupported APIs. They might use facilities that were offered in one operating system that are no longer offered in newer ones because of security, privacy, or performance. And those are the ones that tend to stay longer on one versus the other, especially native applications who, you know, you can fairly have completely reign over the operating system sometimes, um, depending on whether you're on XP or, or before, versus Windows 7 and Windows 8, some of the protections that happen there around services and processes that are running. So developers have lots of choices here, especially when you're building an app uh, for Windows uh, and Windows platforms. Um, and so sometimes they tend to work outside the box, and that's really what creates problems. Uh, and then also sometimes upgrading is a, it takes a little bit of development time to get there. Um, uh, especially if you're using services and things that are no longer available on the latest and greatest. So, I mean, it really depends on scenarios, but you tend to see organizations, they just don't want to fund that because, it, like you said, it's just working. It's it's it's, it's working fine for them. Uh, they feel it's secure enough, and they're just going to continue to just apply some of those security updates and move forward from there. Now, the ones that you see a lot of movement on, I see a lot of movement on fintech and financial areas. People tend to keep those machines updated. They they buy licenses that allow them to stay upgraded, um, and they use cloud software and software on premise network software that allows them to easily upgrade. Um, but again, it's still a problem. It'll still continue to be a problem until um, you know they find it more cost effective ways to get there. So I, I think it, there needs to be some more work done there. You know, I'll, I'll agree with you on the more work needing to be done. And, you know, I, I, I want to turn to to Brian for this because Lou made reference 
to programmers who, who decide to burrow under the operating system. And I've seen this done particularly for performance reasons. They decided that uh, the standard API way of doing something, frequently graphics, just isn't fast enough. From what you've seen, how tempting is it to, to reach down and, and touch the hardware directly rather than going through the, the APIs that the operating system makes available? Uh, for general purpose office applications, I don't see a lot of reasons to do that. However, where it really starts showing up is um, when you start talking to real world sensors. Let's give a direct example. I actually had to try and revive a machine recently. It was actually a Weiss PC um, that goes back many, many, many years. And the it was running Windows XP for one reason, one reason only. The developers were writing directly to the hardware for a device that measured your movement of a knee, you know, a human knee. It was part of physical therapy, and it was in the University of Hawaii um, athletic department, and they just did not have the money to go and buy a new version. And besides, why should they? It was still working. It was still doing its thing. You don't – they need – to be able to measure knee movement, knee capability fairly often, but not every single day. So that was a interesting problem. I also see it in a lot of really old uh, gas pumps. There's still embedded XP in a lot of gas pumps. So when you start talking about specialized vertical markets, that's where I'm starting to see um, people with way too much inertia, way too much friction to be able to move. Um, in fact, in the case of that knee measurement device, the company doesn't even exist. So I see it, but I see it in vertical markets a lot. And those people don't want to move because sometimes the devices don't exist anymore. You know, that's an interesting point. And I know back when I was running a lab, I occasionally had to test something where a customer would say, you can test what, what you want, but don't touch this particular component because it is for everyone on staff a black box. We know what goes in, we know what comes in, goes out, but we have no idea what still happens inside. That's not an uncommon scenario, but that's the sort of thing that I, I feel is going to become increasingly unvaluable as security issues ramp up. Well, this is the kind of thing we're going to talk about more in the future because it's going to keep coming around to bite us. But we're not going to talk about it anymore today because we've got a wonderful guest and Lou wants to get us there. So, Lou, take it away. Thanks, Kurt. Well, next up, we get we got to get to my favorite part of the show is to get a guest in here and drop some knowledge on Twilight. Right? But before we do, we have to thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech. And that is Pulseway. Now, imagine being able to manage, control your entire IT environment from the palm of your hand. That sounds like something futuristic. Well, well, you could reset users' passwords from your phone or kill processes that are slowing down machines while taking a stroll in the park. Well, you don't need to imagine anymore. Pulseway lets you monitor, manage, control all your Windows, Linux, Mac machines from anywhere using any device including your smartphone. Now, Pulseway is the leading provider of mobile first, cloud first, remote monitoring and management software. But you see real time status here, system resources and logged in users, view network performance, Windows updates, IS, SQL Server, Exchange, Active Directory, more and more. You can monitor your, your VMs, your VMware, Hyper-Vs, SMP devices and more. You'll always be in control you can react to issues right away and you can fix those problems right on the go right on the go you can fix them you can run your commands in the terminal manage those running processes you can restart services and more apply those critical updates they handle all the os and app intricacies for you no need to figure out for yourself how to run that powershell script or collect data from the system automate everything now you can create and deploy custom scripts to automate all your it tasks saving time and increasing your team and your efficiency you can automate backups security checks you can schedule them on demand or anytime 
from any device that's closest to you. Now, they actually have a really great patch management system where you can scan and install and update all of your systems on the go, and you can actually be on demand or scheduled as well, and you can execute on a particular date. Now, quickly, with little effort, connect in the computer as if you're sitting right there in front of it without opening any ports, creating any firewall rules with their actually remote desktop control system. It switches between screens, sends keystrokes, and more. It let, lets you do whatever you need to do, even though you might be traveling. Now, if you're ready to take control of your organization's assets without being confined to that desk or to your machine, it's time to take a look at Pulseway. Visit Pulseway.com slash twit and learn how thousands of organizations and system admins are making their IT environment more efficient and secure. Try it free for 14 days at Pulseway.com slash twit. And we thank Pulseway for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's my favorite part of the show. We get to bring a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twire Riot. Now we have two really great sponsors of Twit, Carbonite and Wasabi. And we can thank our guest for these amazing services, Mr. David Friend, CEO of Wasabi. David, it's great to have you on the show. Hey, Lou. So, David... It, you have such a great history. Um, can you kind of take us through the journey uh, in the tech industry? Obviously, we we know about carbonate and wasabi, but we want to hear how you kind of got to those in part of the industries. <laughs> well, I have a degree in music composition uh, as my undergraduate <laughs> degree, and uh, I determined I was never going to survive doing that. So I went to grad school in engineering. Uh, I started a company in the 70s to make uh, synthesizers for rock bands. Uh, that was a successful business, and uh, you know I learned how to get out and sell. And then I've had a succession of software companies since then, including Computer Pictures that was sold to uh, well, a company that's now owned by Oracle, uh, Pilot Software, Faxnet, uh, and several others, up to uh, Carbonite, which you know is a public company and used by millions of people, and now Wasabi, which is really uh, disrupting the cloud storage business. Now, what got you into storage? I know as you started to have a stream of storage things here. Like, What kind of got you into Carbonite? Well, uh, what got me into Carbonite was uh, just realizing that the way people were backing up their computers using external hard drives and that sort of thing was really archaic. And uh, one of my daughters actually had her computer fail at college and she lost a term paper that was due on a Friday. And so I ran down and we took her computer over to one of these labs that uh, professes to be able to recover data from dead hard drives. And they charged me 1300 bucks and they couldn't get the term paper back. And that's when I said, uh, you know, everybody's connected to the internet all the time right now. Why don't we come up with a, uh, a software product that runs in the cloud that just backs up your computer in the background over the internet. And my genius uh, technical partner, Jeff Flowers, figured out a way to store all that data in the cloud at costs that were really disruptive at that time. And uh, that was how we we launched uh, Carbonite. Right, right. So, so they cloud continue. storage experts, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, they continue to be disruptive, I think, uh, in that case. And that kind of leads us to Wasabi. Now, what what was the driving force, like the business prop for, for Wasabi? What, what made you guys start that? So about uh, four years ago, I guess it is now, uh, Jeff, uh, my partner, came to me and said he and our chief architect had a, an, an idea for a new storage architecture using some new storage technologies that, if it worked, would be far cheaper and faster than anything on the planet. And uh, so I encouraged him to uh, take some of the, the key people and go off and see if he could make it work. And a couple of years later, he came back and said they had it working. And uh, at that point, I recruited a new CEO for Carbonite and uh, came over and started Wasabi. And the, the concept is simple. Uh, we think cloud storage is just going to be a commodity like electricity or bandwidth. Um, there's no point really in anybody running their own in-house storage farms anymore. And and we saw this big migration starting of data from on-prem storage to the cloud. And uh, so we made Wasabi to be uh, exactly plug compatible with Amazon S3, which is the leading uh, product in the market right now. 
So you can unplug anything that works with Amazon S3 and plug in Wasabi. The difference is Wasabi is one fifth the price and about uh, six times faster. So it's wow. uh, it's pretty disruptive. And, and we've been on a tear uh, since we launched the company. Uh, really, we just launched in May of 2017. We've raised about $80 million in capital. We now have data centers in Virginia, uh, out on the West Coast, and in Europe. And uh, we've been growing about 25% month over month. And uh, it took us about five months to sell our first petabyte of storage. And now we roll in a petabyte of storage every few days. So it's uh, it's been kind of crazy. <laughs> wow. Now, let's talk a little bit about the technology here. Now, there, there, you said there's some in interesting technology that's kind of below the surface here. Um, right. And we've we talked a little bit about it, about the whole sequential laying disk data on disks for sequentially. Now, how, how is this working? Like, is it is it required that, like, because most OSs don't do it this way. Most kernels don't do it this way. Did you guys, did you guys have to create a specialized OS, specialized kernel to do this? Yeah, we don't use Linux or Windows or any other operating system to determine where the bits go on disk. And, uh, you know, I think the uh, 10 years or so that we had at Carbonite dealing with this has given us some unique experience. So our, our engineers actually know how to get down and control the movement of the heads on the disk drives. And we put the bits on disk where we want them to go, not where Linux or Windows wants them to go. And this allows us to pack more data on disk uh, it allows us to pack the data on disk in ways that we can read large files, read and write large files very, very quickly uh, at probably very close to the theoretical throughput of the drives themselves. Um, we arrange the the, uh, the data striped across multiple servers so that it, we have a very high degree of uh, redundancy. So we get 11 nines of durability, which is the same as Amazon. And uh, at the same time, we extend the, the life of the drives. And this is techniques that we learned at Carbonite. Um, and by extending the life of the drives, you can also cut your costs pretty dramatically. And we designed our data centers to be completely lights out. Um, you know, disk drives can fail, but uh, we have so much hot swap, uh, hot spares sitting around in our data centers that we don't have to visit the data center to do disk replacements and things like that, except once every three months or so. Wow. So we've gotten very good at shaving pennies. We're kind of like the Walmart of storage, you know, always the lowest <laughs> price. That's our, that's our motto. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, it sounds like lower price doesn't mean that you're actually giving up other things like performance and durability, which is super awesome. That I definitely think that's disruptive. Now, the question, the interesting question here is that it sounds like it's so disrupt disruptive. Then why why hasn't other storage providers been tried to do this? Like especially since that you're faster, you're more durable. This obviously just should start raising eyebrows for them, right? Why are they not doing this? Well, you know, there may be, uh, well, first of all, I mean, companies like Amazon, uh, for, for people like Amazon, I think it's almost as big a, uh, an issue the, with the uh, profit and loss statement as it is the technology. Um, you know, Amazon is charging 2.1 to 2.3 cents per gigabyte per month for S3. They probably have five or six billion dollars worth of revenue. And I would not want to be the person that walks into the CFO's office and says, you know, uh, gee, I think we ought to cut our price on Amazon S3 by 80 percent, knock four billion dollars off the top and bottom line because some little company in Boston is running annoying advertisements. <laughs> um, but it is very difficult technology. I mean, there's no way we could do what we're doing today had we not had 10 years of experience um, doing this kind of software at, uh, at Carbonite. And uh, anybody who's starting out today uh, has, uh, you know, at least two years of development ahead of them, assuming they're not going to make all the mistakes that we made when we were uh, learning all the tricks that we know how to do at Carbonite. So it's a, it's a tough slog. And in addition to that, you're going to have to raise a lot of money now because, you know, we've raised a big war chest and uh, we're out there in the market uh, building a trusted brand. And, uh, you know, when I think of trusted brands, I think of companies like Iron Mountain, for example, that when you think of storing a, a physical box of paper, you think of Iron Mountain. And when you think about uh, storing digital data, we want you to think Wasabi. 
Absolutely. Now, the interesting thing here is the technology you're using is, it sounds like you're using still traditional discs, which allow you to still keep the prices down, uh, also offer, uh, like you said, a little bit more durability. Is that right? You're still using like the traditional, I guess, the, like the public guys to call spin discs? Yes, we're, we're using spinning discs. We're using uh, SMR, the new shingle magnetic recording drives, because they allow us to pack more data on disk. Um, you know, the bad news about SMR is you can't really just use it with a block-oriented file system like Linux. So you better be prepared to get down there and, and do what we did, which is really build your own file system. Right, right. Now, the interesting thing here is how does this compare? A lot of these cloud providers are they're advertising that, hey, that we're using super high performance SSD drives. You can pay for the higher tier to get that. Um, how does this how does it compare to those? Is it is it still a comparable? Is it is it obviously it's cheaper? Um, yeah, I mean, a disk is not as fast as an SSD. Uh, at least time to first byte. Um, our time to first byte is probably in the neighborhood of 15 to 25 milliseconds typically. So it's considerably faster than S3. But because we're reading and writing uh, in parallel from a large number of drives, once we get going, if you're reading a large file, <clears throat> excuse me, like a, a video or something of that nature, we can surf it up really fast and, you know, we can serve it up at 40, 50 uh, gig, um, gigs per second. So it's, oh. you know, we can, if you've got a 10 gigabyte pipe going to Wasabi, a gigabit pipe going to Wasabi, we can saturate that no problem. Wow. Well, folks, when we come back, we want to talk a little bit more with David about Wasabi and the technology disruption that it has. But before we do, we want to thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's LinkedIn Talent Solutions. Now, let me ask you, where are all the professionals at? Well, you know, they're on LinkedIn. Now, if you're already ready to hire from your, whether it's your small business or your enterprise, you naturally want to find the best person for the job. And odds are they're probably already on LinkedIn. Now, it's the world's largest professional network. 70% of the U.S. workforce is on LinkedIn. Some of the biggest names in the industry post content on there every day. I post on their jobs, interests, technology. I post about Twiat and Twit. Uh, my professional network wouldn't be what it is today without LinkedIn. That just goes to show you that LinkedIn can really help your business. Now, here's how. Post your job where people go every day to make those connections, grow in their career, and discover new and great op job opportunities. Now, you probably used other sites before, but they just don't feel right, right? They're, they're clunky. They, they, the, the responses that you get for your jobs are really not from the right people. Well, LinkedIn can really help with that. What I've seen from my job posts on LinkedIn is that LinkedIn jobs are matched based on skills and background. Plus, they have that secret sauce recipe by also matching based off of interests and activities and passions as well. That's pretty impressive if you think about it that, because that really gets the right person for the right job. Whether, well, it means that LinkedIn can really just find that the most relevant qualified candidate for that job you're looking to fill. Now, and that way you can focus your, on the candidates that you really want to spend time talking to. And so you can make that really high quality hire and you can get excited about it. Now, if you think about it, there are 500 million pros on LinkedIn every day. LinkedIn is really the best way to get your job opportunity out there to the right people. Now, why else would customers rate LinkedIn jobs? Number one, and delivering quality hires? Well, it's because it just works. It gives you the tools and the target the right generation of workforce with laser precision. Now, I bet you wouldn't be surprised if I told you that a new hire is made every eight seconds on LinkedIn. Now, I've used them in the past, and it's amazing how fast you can really get and scale your talent acquisition with LinkedIn. Now, post a job today at linkedin.com slash this week and get $50 off your first job post. That's linkedin.com slash this week to get $50 off your first job post. LinkedIn.com slash this week. Terms and conditions apply. And we thank LinkedIn for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, we're talking with Mr. David Friend, CEO of Wasabi, about some of the disruptive technology that's happening at Wasabi. David, I want to talk a little bit about latency just for a second. Then I want to bring my co-host back in. Um, so you talked about how some people are already might be um, invested in Amazon cloud services. They might maybe already be on S3 or maybe they're just looking to find that next cloud storage. How, how can you ensure kind of the latency? Because if somebody says, hey, I want to I want to use I want to use Wasabi because it is it is less expensive and I get same similar performance. 
Um, I want to use them, but they must be in their own data centers. They must be they must be farther away from my 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 service or my my PaaS service or my SaaS service. Is that true? Is it or are they you're getting similar latencies? Um, well, generally, uh, you know, if you're within thirty or forty milliseconds of one of our data centers, and our our two big big U.S. data centers are in uh, Virginia and in Portland, Oregon, and uh, you know, we generally uh, don't see latency as be, being as big an issue as throughput. And uh, so, you know, once you once you are more than 60 or 70 milliseconds away from one of our data centers, you're going to start to see performance will slow down. But that's true of, of any cloud service. So, you know, over the next few years, obviously, we'll be opening more data centers. Uh, we've opened one in Europe now and, and uh, we'll be soon opening one up in Japan. And, uh, and then we'll be back in the U.S. opening additional data centers in the U.S. to get closer to our to our customers for those people who are doing uh, big data analysis and things of that sort where they really need to move uh, a lot of data very quickly between storage and compute. But in, in general, it, you know, we're no different than Amazon in that respect. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, one one big thing that that really kind of like raised my eyebrow when I was looking at Wasabi was the fact as a developer, I do a lot of you know API calls. I like to get data in and out. I like to load it in the cache. The fact that uh, you even have it on your sign there behind you about the no no egress fees. Now, what what made you guys do that? I mean, that sounds like something that a lot of these services they, they they charge you for, right? They charge you for how often you access your data. What was this just to kind of get you in the market, or is there a reason behind that? Well, while Jeff was uh, spending two years building the product, I was out talking to customers, and uh, I can tell you. People hate egress fees, and <laughs> they uh, do. <laughs> the, and the reason they hate egress fees is if if you have an IT budget, um, you know you generally know how much data you have, so it's easy to figure out what your your costs are going to be from a standpoint of uh, you know how many gigabytes you have or whatever. But nobody knows how much uh, egress they have. Nobody knows whether they are. Uh, you know, touching their data one time a month, 10 times a month, whatever. And so it makes your bill unpredictable. And then if you scroll around on the internet, you'll find a lot of stories of people who were totally shocked when they get their first Amazon bill. And uh, for example, um, Glacier, which is Amazon's kind of low priced, uh, sort of three hour response time cloud service is 0.4 cents per gigabyte per month. But the egress fee starts at nine cents. So you're talking about, uh, you know, four dollars per month per terabyte, but it's ninety dollars per terabyte to access your data. So if you download your data once, you've you've gotten like one hundred and eighty times your bill. (laughs) So it's like, you know, it, it makes it very, very difficult for people to predict. And so one of the things that uh, that we did at Carbonite was People didn't know how much data they had for their backups. So we said, let's make unlimited backup for a flat price and we'll probably lose money on a very small percentage of our customers. Well, we did the same kind of thing with Wasabi. People hate egress charges. So we said, let's eat the egress fees ourselves, build it into the the price of the service and we'll probably lose money on a very small number of people who who abuse the, the privilege, but it's worth it in order to have a really great experience for everybody else. Absolutely. And you're By right. the way, we also, we also don't charge for API calls or anything else. You know, your typical Amazon bill might have 18 light items on it. Your Wasabi bill really has one line item, which is the <laughs> amount of storage, period, and that's it. <laughs> you're right. I've seen I've seen bills like this, and it is very hard to follow. Number one, number two, you're right. Businesses hate the fact that the predictability there is not there. There's no static cost. It's just... I don't know if my service is being used more. If I've designed it in a way that it has more access, yeah. I'm going to pay more. So, I mean, that's that's not that's definitely not a good thing to fix uh, for sure. Yeah. Now, I do it want to bring my just, co- uh, it, it also just bugs people that, yeah. you know, you can put your data in for free. But, oh, if you want to get it back, you know, that's then right. you have to pay. That's and right. that just doesn't feel right to people that they should have to pay to get their own data back. Right, right. Well, I do want to bring my co-host in. Um, so I'll start with uh, Curtis. Curtis, you had some questions about mar- the market. 
Yeah, I'm I'm curious. You know, you're talking about the way people are using this and and what you thought about as you were putting this service together. But we've seen a number of different cloud storage companies that, that started off with very broad applications, but over time they started focusing on particular use cases and, and in some cases limiting what could be done with the data going in and out, what kind of files have all that. Um, how big is the temptation to to place some sort of limit on who you're marketing to and the kind of services you're going to allow? And do you have a particular kind of customer in mind with what you're doing to begin with? Well, you know, we see ourselves kind of like the electric company. Um, you got one plug in the wall. It doesn't matter whether you plug in your computer or your hair dryer. And that's kind of the way I see storage. It's a kind of a one size fits all. You know, Wasabi is faster than S3 and it's cheaper than Glacier. So why do you need all these goofy tiers of storage in between? And uh, so, you know, when you start to look at yourself like a utility, um, then, you know, you're servicing a pretty much 90% of the kind of applications that are out there. Now, I will say that the kind of customers we like the best are people who are storing very large amounts of data, uh, typically larger files for a long period of time. So, you know, some of our biggest customers are in the movie and TV industry and they're storing, uh, you know, copies of Star Wars or old TV shows from the 50s or who knows what. But uh, that kind of data is going to be in our data center for years and years to come. And, um, you know, so that's a, a really good, uh, a really good kind of customer. Other Applications are also media rich, surveillance is one, genomics, things like satellite imagery, um, um, telescopes, uh, you know, anything that's generating medical imagery, 3D images from, uh, from uh, MRI and, and uh, other kinds of uh, medical devices. So, Anytime there's a lot of data to be stored where the cost of storing the data starts to become a big deal uh, for the customer, that's really when Wasabi uh, kind of earns its stripes. All right. So we've got the use case there. I want to ask uh, one more question, and this is uh, something of interest to me because of my day job. We've seen a number of cases lately where people inadvertently made a, a database publicly accessible because they misconfigured uh, the, the database. This has been a particular issue with, with S3 buckets. Um, how is Wasabi about making sure that it's not sort of the default to, to be publicly accessible and making it so that companies find it easier to be secure than not? Um, you, you know, essentially we use the same uh, identity and access management that uh, Amazon uses. So if you're careless with your credentials, um, you know, you're going to have the exact same security issues that you would have with any cloud service. Um, having said that, um, in, data is encrypted in transit, data is encrypted at rest. And, uh, you know, if you spread your credentials around in a way that's unsafe, it, your data is going to be uh, insecure no matter where you store it. What I, what I will say, though, is that uh, one of the things we did pay attention to is data loss. Because if you're a hospital and you have to comply with HIPAA, or if you're a bank and you have to comply with FINRA, um, if you lose your data, you're subject to fines and, and getting sued and all kinds of things. And I know from 10 years in the backup business that the probably the most common way that people lose data is through accidental deletions, you know, fat fingering, or you have a disaffected employee, essentially employee sabotage. Somebody decides to blow up a data, database because they're, uh, they've been fired and they're being ushered out the door. Or you have application software that has uh, bugs in it that causes data to be accidentally overwritten or hackers break in from the outside. 
Um, so we implemented something in Wasabi called the immutable buckets. And when you set up a bucket in Wasabi, you can make it immutable, meaning that for some predetermined period of time, nobody can either delete the file, delete a, a file or modify a file. And there's a chain of custody that goes along with that. So um, if you know that you're going to be keeping this uh, medical data around for seven years in order to comply with uh, with some government regulation, you set up a bucket with a seven year expiration and anything you add to that bucket is going to be there for seven years no matter what. Um, neither a Wasabi employee nor the customer or an intruder on their own can delete or modify that data. Fantastic. I want to throw it over to Brian. Brian, you had some questions about adoption. Yeah. Um, hey, I'm <laughs> I'm a Glazier customer. I've had one of those bills. Um, yeah. It's it's spectacular enough that I will restore only if it's the last resort. <laughs> so yeah. from a new customer point of view, there I actually have a question out of the chat room and they say uh, from Specs, is data being replicated between the data centers? And also, if I'm a new customer, what kinds of things do I need to do to get started? Well, let me start with that first. Um, there, there are hundreds of uh, software programs, uh, over 200 of which are listed on our website, uh, that have S3 connectors on the back. And those would include backup programs like uh, Veeam, Commvault, uh, Cloudberry, many, many others to, uh, you know, video editing programs, surveillance software, all kinds of things. And so, you know, if you want to get started, if you just want to try Wasabi and you don't know how to use an S3 API, there are a couple of little uh, Windows and Mac gateways uh, that are free on our website. You can download. Uh, I use one on my Windows computer here and it creates a little W drive, so it looks just like an external hard drive, but it's actually, um, you know, using Wasabi in the cloud to store essentially a bottomless uh, kind of a, a NAS of infinite capacity, if you will. Um, so, you know, that's the, uh, that's kind of how I would recommend uh, people getting started. What was your other question? <laughs> well, I was asking about um, replicating between data centers and actually, ah. Right. You know, God, God forbid the West Coast should fall off the face of the earth because of a giant earthquake. Um, how do, <laughs> what do you do about yeah. that? Yeah, well, you can replicate. You, you have to choose to do this, obviously, but you can replicate from East Coast to West Coast, West Coast to East Coast, uh, East Coast to Europe, uh, whatever you want. So, you know, we do allow, allow cross-region replication. Fantastic. Oh. Cool. Well, I, unfortunately, uh, David, we're running a little bit low on time, but I did, before we close up, I did wanted to give you a chance to maybe tell the folks at home and organizations that are listening uh, about where they can find Wasabi, how can they get started, that kind of thing. Yeah, the uh, Wasabi website, uh, www.wasabi.com, has a lot of uh, technical papers, white papers, videos, uh, all sorts of things that will help you. And there's also a free trial there you can download. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, you can sign up for an account and get a terabyte of uh, Wasabi storage for a month to give it a try. Uh, as I mentioned, there are also these little uh, free tools that you can use to help try if you don't know how to use a, an S3 API. And uh, there's a chat window. You can talk to a technical rep on the website and if you have any questions. So pretty simple to get started. Uh, we bend over backwards for customers with good support. Fantastic. Mr. David Friends, CEO of Wasabi. David, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk to our audience. I'm sure they got lots of great information. We would love to have you back, though, someday. Good. Thanks, Lou. I appreciate it. It was uh, fun being here. Mr. David Friends, CEO of Wasabi. Well, unfortunately, folks, you've done it again. You've sat through another hour of the best dang enterprise podcast, according to nine out of 10 bits on your speculative execution, execution cash. But I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my co host in crime, starting with our very own geek in paradise, Mr. Brian Chi. Chibert, where can the folks find you and all of your work? And of course, some little uh, tease into something that's going on soon. Well, I, my Twitter address is ADVNETLAB, Advanced Net Lab. 
Or you can drop me a line at chibert at twit.tv. Or better yet, why don't you use twiet at twit.tv and that'll hit all the hosts. And the teaser is we're getting started on our first twiet after school special. Um, our good friend Tim Titus, uh, the CTO of Path Solutions, and I put our heads together and started thinking, gee, there our viewers keep pounding on me via email, Twitter, you name it. They'd like to have more detail on certain things. So we started and built a five-part after-school special um, on VoIP troubleshooting. The one that's going to be today is we're going to go over how VoIP or unified communications work. And we're going to roll into other topics like how to solve drops and clipping, echo problems, one-way audio, and garbled audio. Fantastic. Looking forward to that. We'll uh, we'll have to see if we can post it so everyone can take a look at that once you guys are done with that. Um, of course, uh, we want to thank our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. Where we're, Curtis, where can the folks find you and all of your work? Of course, uh, give us a little tease of what you're doing at uh, Interop as well. Well, as always, people can find my writing at darkreading.com and uh, they'll be able to follow along next week. Pardon me. As I work out in Las Vegas at Interop, uh, I'll be writing about that at Dark Reading. I'll also be tweeting heavily from my account at KG4GWA. I'll also be doing some Instagramming, Kurt underscore Franklin, and I hope that people will find and follow me on all of those. Yeah, I'm going to be talking to quite a number of security folks out in Las Vegas, uh, especially those around the the joint areas of security and networking. That's a big deal out there. Lots to talk about, lots to share with people. So follow along if you can't make your way to the desert. Would love to ask questions on your behalf or um, answer questions that you might have about what's going on out there. Thanks, guys. Well, folks, we also have to thank you as well. You are the person that drops in each and every week to watch and listen to the show to get your enterprise goodness. And we want to make it easy for you to listen and catch up on your enterprise news. So go out right now to our show page, twit.tv slash twiet, and there you'll be able to see all of our amazing back episodes, plus all the show notes, co-host information, guest information, and links to those stories we do during the show. But more importantly, next to the videos, you'll get those helpful download and subscribe links. Uh, support the show by getting the audio version, video version, HD a video version of your choice. Listen on any one of your devices. And make it really easy for you to get your enterprise and IT news goodness. Now, after you subscribe, share it with your friends, family, coworkers. I'd guarantee they'll definitely get a lot of great news and information out of it, just as you're doing as well. Now, after you subscribe, remember we do this show live each and every week at 1.30 p.m. Pacific time on Fridays. Of course, if you're going to jump and watch the show live, jump into our chat room live as well. We got some amazing information and questions from the chat room today. I have it right here on my screen uh, and so do the co-hosts and we, we kind of channel that excitement from the chat from the chat room over to our guests and to, to our team members around around show content so definitely jump in there live and join the show now we have a survey as well that actually focuses on how you use collaborative software at work it's brief it takes about six minutes and it doesn't collect any personal data please go to twit.com sorry twit.to slash survey 14 that's twit.to slash survey 14 14 and go ahead and answer some questions about how you use collaborative software at work. Also, don't forget you can follow me at twitter.com slash Lou MM. We can see where all I do. I post my stuff about my normal job and all the things I do during the week, especially you can check out dev.office.com where you can see all the latest and greatest stuff that my team does about extending an office and making it more productive for you. I also want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support us each and every week to do this week at Enterprise Tech. And we we couldn't do this show without them. I also want to thank all the engineers at Twit. And also thank you to our loyal producer, who is also Mr. Brian Chi, our, our co-host in crime. He's also our Tyler's producer. He does all the bookings, the plannings for the show. 
Um, he's also planning this after after school special that he's doing. He's doing so much. We couldn't do the show without him. Thank you to Brian uh, for all his hard work and his dedication to Twyatt. And of course, before we t- sign out, I also want to thank our TD for today. Now, we had a little bit of Alex in the beginning, but of course, Victor for the majority of the show. Victor, were you here long enough to know, to get the, the essence of the show today? What was the main topic of the show? Yes, I think so. Uh, well, first things first, the, uh, the Twyatt special will be published as TwitBits on our site. Fantastic. So that's how you can get them after the fact. Um, but what I learned today is Brian lives in Hawaii because he thinks us in California are going to fall off the map. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, I, unfortunately, it was it was not not exactly, not exactly. It was more about the was the Walmart of pricing here and that would be Wasabi cloud storage and being disruptive in the cloud storage market, but very very close maybe next time. And maybe next time. <laughs> maybe next time, maybe next time. Uh, and until next time, I'm Luis Moresca, just reminding you If you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Chibert, and I'm coming to you, well, kind of live. This is going to be our first attempt at doing a quiet after school special where as per your request, we're going to dive into some technical um, issues that's going to help you do your job better. For our first one, we're going to be starting to talk about uh, the kinds of things that happen to a VoIP infrastructure. And to join us, we've got the CTO of Path Solutions, Mr. Tim Titus. And let's go talk VoIP, shall we? Hi, Tim. How are you doing? Hey, Brian. Thanks for the invite. For this first segment that we do VoIP troubleshooting, why don't we start talking about how VoIP works? You know, there's a couple of different protocols involved. It's not, you know, your old granddad's plain old telephone system. Why don't we talk about how the nuts and bolts work and, you know, we'll set the pace for the rest of the segments. Sure, sure. So... Uh, it, just like what you said, it's not just a pair of wires like the old POTS phone systems. It's a lot of complexity. And that complexity makes it so that there's a lot of places things can go wrong and a lot of reasons at each of those places that you can have problems. This is why a lot of folks end up having problems with VoIP. So we're going to go into talking about the two different protocols for this segment, the two different protocols that make VoIP work. So those two protocols are SIP and RTP. Now, SIP is Session Initiation Protocol. Uh, There's a lot of documentation out there about SIP. I'm just going to shorten it up and tell you really the purpose of SIP is it's the administrative protocol for VoIP. What it does is it sets up calls and tears down calls. Uh, If you're familiar with how the web works, it's kind of like how Uh, DNS is really an administrative protocol, and HTTP is the page rendering protocol. You can't really have the internet work without uh, DNS. You you need DNS to be able to look up addresses, and you also need to have uh, 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 HTTP uh, do the page rendering. So just like you have two protocols to make the web work, you have two protocols to make VoIP work. Now, SIP doing its administrative setup and teardown as I'm going to show with uh, slide uh, zero, is the SIP ladder. Now, when you have a pair of phones, there's proper SIP communication that happens between these phones. You send an invite packet out to the other phone. It then sends back trying, and it sends back ringing. Uh, The trying and the ringing are basically to tell you that the other side actually is ringing the phone. Uh, You then get an OK, that it's OK to accept the phone. You have an acknowledgment. At that point, the media starts, and the media is, this is the RTP stream that occurs that actually sends the voice packets back and forth. When the phone call is done, you send a buy back uh, to the other side, you get an OK back from the other side, and the communication is torn down. All of these green items are SIP. The media is that light blue color, so that's the RTP. So you can see how... SIP is responsible for the administrative side of ringing the phone, checking to see if the phone is available, 
Uh, also finding out where the phone is. Uh, you would end up doing SIP communications back with your PBX to determine what is the IP address of a remote phone or a remote gateway. But it does all of the administration of the communications. And then the media will send the voice protocol. Now, you look at these numbers and say, OK, there's 100 trying, 180 ringing. What's really nice is Wikipedia has a great article on the SIP response codes so that if you're ever curious to learn, I, I just set up a sniffer. I captured some of the SIP packets and I'm not sure what I'm seeing here, but you have a good grouping of responses where the 100 series responses are uh, uh, provisional response codes. 200 means it's been a successful connection. Uh, 300 series, you have redirection. Typically, if you have failures, you're going to see failures in the 400 series or 500 series or 600 series. So there's all sorts of different reasons that you can have failures. And I figure if you use this Wikipedia article, it's a great reference for why SIP had problems setting up or communicating. Yeah, so like if I'm using some of the fancy schmancy sniffer products that have VoIP overlays, they're actually looking up these codes for me to help me figure out what's going on? Exactly, exactly. Um, actually, I'm going to say you don't even need a fancy smancy, uh, uh, smancy, I haven't used that word in forever, <laughs> Sniff, sniffer product. Um, Wireshark has some great decoding abilities for SIP. Uh, and so you set that up with Wireshark, do your capture, and it's going to show you that SIP ladder very f uh, similar to what my, uh, my diagram showed. So like, for instance, obviously we're not, we don't always know the address of the other phone. So somewhere in there, there's a call manager or some sort of server involved that I guess would be doing something like what DNS does. Exactly. It's doing the lookups for you to say, for that phone number you dialed, here is the IP address. Go send a request to ring the phone and get a ring response and then have the other side answer and then have that communication established. And at that point, you have RTP sending the payload back and forth. So, but RTP is basically a fairly low level protocol. Isn't there some kind of like modulation or encoding that sits on top of RTP? Well, so you're correct in that RTP will send the packetized information back and forth. On top of that RTP packet, or I should say actually encapsulated inside of that RTP packet, is the codec. And so the voice information can be compressed and put into that packet in a number of different formats, and that would be your voice codec. G711 is a standardized codec that a lot of systems use. It has benefits and drawbacks based upon the payload size, based upon its ability to deal with uh, latency and jitter. There's G729, uh, a low bandwidth version that's 8 kilobits per second. Uh, so there's a number of different codecs. And to deal with all of the different conditions on networks, you can choose different codecs to be able to handle a lossy environment or an environment that has really high latency. So choosing the codec for the environment tends to be an important uh, piece of the picture. On the other hand, I'll say is as networks get more and more reliable, and as networks get to be more and more low latency, uh, you're going to end up having less of a need to be specific about which codec you choose, and people are just going to want to default to saying, I can take 64K of bandwidth for a phone call on my network, and it's not going to impact anything. Whereas it used to be G711 was the bandwidth hog. Taking 64K when you could choose to take only 8K per call uh, yeah, you, you might have a T1 link that you needed to actually do some protection there and say, let's let's use only 8K per call. Nowadays, I think most people, they don't care as much. G711 is fine, and you get more of an HD quality when you end up having uh, a G711 call. It's, it's a little bit more crystal clear. Uh, there's not as much fuzz in the conversation. So I guess what we can do is just kind of set aside the codex, Let's talk about the nuts and bolts, how the base framework for all this starts working. So we talked about how SIP does the administration of connecting things. Then you get uh, to the point where the RTP is established and you're communicating with the other slide, uh, the other side. 
what I'd like to do is show uh, uh, slide number two, which effectively is that it is a two separate streams. This is bi-directional. And these two streams are truly separate. They're not like uh, uh, TCP where you end up having uh, one side end up, uh, you have uh, one stream communicate both parts. These are two separate streams. Now, with two separate streams, you do have some potential problems. You can end up having a situation where one stream is perfectly fine, and then if you show slide number three, you could have the other side have a problem. So this is what can lead to problems with one-way audio. This can lead to problems when you end up having a user saying, hey, I can hear you perfectly fine, but you're hearing problems when you, I'm talking, you're having problems hearing me. And so there's one-way audio problems, which in many cases, that's what the problem is. It's a one-way audio problem. So these two separate streams, additionally, they can take completely different paths through the network. So you can have one stream take a nice short path, let's say from San Francisco to New York, and the return path might go from New York to London to Moscow to Tokyo to Hawaii and then back to San Francisco and clear around the other side of the planet. So these two separate streams, they can end up having di different interactions based upon their path that they take out and the path that they take back. Right, so like when you and I were working on interop, a lot of times when we were talking about you know problems with split paths, We'd ask yep. people to do a trace route from one direction and then the other to see if the uh, streams took different paths. So that's the kind of thing we're, we need to start looking for, right? Yeah, that's one thing you can do. Uh, if you end up having a higher latency environment and you're saying, gee, you know, we have latency that's over 200 milliseconds, you might think, okay, let's do a trace route from both ends to find out if they're taking the same path out or the same path back. Uh, because you might find that the path out is nice and short. The path back takes 16 different hops. Um, typically, that, what that's called is it's called asymmetric routing. Your routing is not symmetrical. And in most cases, your routing is going to be symmetrical. Uh, the way networks are designed these days, they're designed to support getting symmetric paths out and back. But with certain load balancing, sometimes doesn't work properly, uh, you end up having asymmetric paths. Now, a few other things about RTP is that not only are they two streams, but you also have some strange limitations on these packets. SIP packets, if they're dropped, they can be retransmitted. Again, it's an administrative protocol. You drop one, it'll just ask for a retransmit, it will retransmit the packet, you'll have the data. RTP, you cannot retransmit the data. The reason for that is, is that let's say you transmit the data and then a few moments later, the data is transmitted again, you can't insert that data into the time, timeline. This is live streaming data, and if things arrived out of order or things were retransmitted, you'd start sounding like Yoda, where you'd have words in the wrong location, phrases in the wrong location, and it just would sound weird. So there is no ability to do a retransmit with RTP. Lost data is just that, lost data. Yeah, and isn't uh, RTP typically sent over UDP packets? So those are kind of like a Hail Mary anyway? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So RTP, and actually, very good point, is the SIP packets are, are UDP, the RTP packets are UDP. So you're right, they are sent out there in the blind. Uh, they expect that it's just going to get there. And if it doesn't get there, it's not going to make any attempt to retransmit. Okay, now, a, help me out with this. I think I maybe have a fallacy. Wasn't SIP, I thought SIP was more like HT, you know, the HTTP DNS work was uh, TCP based, not UDP based. Well, I think there's, Did I the, misunderstand ability, that? there's the ability to have SIP run either uh, UDP or TCP. SIP will end up asking for specific retransmits um, so it doesn't really need TCP. There's no stream of data that it's going to be moving. So it's typically to reduce the overhead typically done with UDP just so that it can control the retransmits. It's, it's, you know, the, the problem with TCP is you're doing a three packet setup, a two packet teardown, and that becomes very expensive when all you want to do is pass a single message. Uh, and oh, if you pass a single awesome. SIP, yeah, you pass a single SIP message, you can get a single response done by the protocol, uh, I'm sorry, done by SIP 
asking for the response versus if you had TCP just to say, hey, where's this phone located? You do that three packet setup, you do the communication of saying, where is the, the phone for this? And then you tear it down. It would just be pretty costly. So that's why it's typically done with a, a lower overhead protocol. Uh, but you can get retries done in SIP, but SIP will be responsible for doing those retries. Oh, now, that's very cool. That, that might explain why um, I see options when I start playing with this, especially when you start sending this stuff over satellite communications networks. Yeah, really high latency links. You get all sorts of weird problems. Um, but typically, it's still you, you rely upon the protocol for doing the retransmits. Now, as I mentioned, all the retransmits for SIP, there is a limited number of retransmits that it will do, typically two or three. Uh, most people don't get into configuring this to say, gee, do five retransmits or anything like that. But it, it's that it, it manages all of those retransmits from the protocol level, and it's going to do two or three retransmits. If it still can't get the data there, it's not going to establish the call. But at that point, the call is it fails because of those retransmits. Um, it's not a voice quality problem. It's a call establishment problem. So, you know, this is sounding like there's a whole bunch of pieces orbiting each other. Um, and they all have to talk in the right order and things like that. Are, you represent a company that actually makes a tool to figure this kind of stuff out, don't you? Isn't it called yeah. TotalView? Yep, yep, yep. Uh, so we do. Uh, before I, I go into that, I do want to still mention uh, two things that are different about RTP is that RTP is very susceptible to out of order packets. And I've been on a, a huge soapbox talking to folks as much as I can about this is that people think, gee, it's just packet loss. And if you have no packet loss in your network, you're going to have perfect voice quality. And I say, no, not necessarily. More and more networks have load balance links. You'll have layer two trunk ports that are load balanced. You'll have layer three links that are load balanced. If your load balancing is configured for per packet load balancing, that means each packet will take whichever way it chooses uh, that is least load balanced. You're going to have packets go out various different links and it just, you know, one link after another. There's no guarantee that the packets will arrive in the same order. And again, they will arrive. Let's say you have no packet loss. They all arrive. The codec receiving this has to throw away the out-of-order packets. It can't deal with that. It can't resequence them in time. Now, I'm going to put a little asterisk there and say there is a jitter buffer built into the receiving devices that can try to resequence packets, but I'll say in most cases they can't. So out-of-order packets is the next biggest problem following packet loss that people have in a network. And the packets arrived perfectly fine. There were, there were no problems with arrival, but that load balancing of per packet load balancing is the problem. If you had per session load balancing, where all packets from one session go one path through the network, that's going to be rock solid. Right. So then, like, for instance, when I set up some firewalls, there are specific configuration items for VoIP, uh, especially for SIP to try and keep those sessions together instead of load balancing it. So I'm assuming that's what those guys are trying to do, right? Actually, slightly, uh, no, no. What the firewalls have is when the firewall does NAT, does address translation from the inside to the outside, SIP would break. It would not be able to communicate the inside to outside IP address through NAT. But if it understands, if the firewall understands that it's doing NAT and it's doing voice, it can fake the call and proxy the SIP information on the outside. So that's why that firewall configuration is there for SIP. The RTP, though, it's not doing any load balancing. It's doing, uh, the firewall is not doing any load balancing. It would just send the RTP packets through and do the, uh, the, uh, the NAT as it would naturally. Super cool. So the last thing so, I wanted to hit on, though, is that D, uh, the RTP packets, they should always be DSCP tagged. Uh, and they should be DSCP tagged with EF. That's the, the industry standard at this point is EF is express forwarding. That means that these packets should not be dropped. They should always go first if there's any sort of line or queue as far as buffering. That gives them what's called high priority. And... 
Uh, DSCP EF is like putting little lights and sirens on the packet saying these always go to the front of the line. These always go through the routers first. Uh, never drop these. Make sure they get to their destination. And that way the data packets are delayed. Other packets just they're, they're put into a buffer. These packets go first and that will help ensure voice quality uh, along those those high priority QoS links. You okay, don't back need up to put just a bit. I'm sorry. Go no, ahead. Just back up and let's go to what let's define what that acronym means. DSCP. So differentiated services code point. It's a, it's a little bizarre, but uh, you should be able to do a lookup of this. Differentiated services code point is a packet prioritization that is put on the IP header of a packet. If you look at a uh, a sniffer trace. Uh, and end up having uh, a, a full decode of your packet and you look at all of the header fields in that IP header. This is, again, before you're looking at whether it's a UDP packet or a TCP packet or whatever the, the, the port is. It, it's in the IP header and it is, what is the prioritization of sending this packet through the network? And so you can put in and say, this should be a medium level priority, this should be low level priority, Typically, if it's zero, it's going to be low-level priority. Uh, but EF is reserved for express forwarding, which is uh, voice-tagged packets. Cool. So what else do you want to tell us in this segment? Well, so again, RTP should be EF-tagged. That way, the voice stream is always cut to the front. You don't need to have SIP be high-priority tagged. People might think, gee, SIP should also be high priority tagged, and it doesn't. Um, if you do have networks that have a lot of loss and you're having problems with call establishment, then okay, maybe putting your SIP in with that and say also have it EF tagged so that it's not dropped in the network, that will help. But you don't typically need SIP to be. You definitely want RTP to be protected with EF. Very cool. So. I've been chatting with Tim Titus, uh, CTO of Path Solutions. Tim, where can people go and get more information? You know, I'm sure you've got some lessons on your website. Why don't you tell the viewers about those? Sure. So on our website, www.pathsolutions.com, uh, we have a blog entry with some really great entries on VoIP, on jitter, on latency, uh, packet loss. How do you find these problems? How do you solve these problems? And because we're engineers, we give you... Here's how you would find and solve those problems. And that way you can solve the problems on your own. Uh, if you want the easy way, uh, then take a look at our product. We've built a lot of tools, a lot of capabilities to be able to make the easy way to solve these problems uh, really just a couple clicks of a button to be able to say, where is the packet loss coming from? Why are we having packet loss? Where do we have latency? Why are these problems happening so that engineers can solve problems quickly? Super cool. Okay, well, this has been a Twilight Afternoon special. This is segment one, how does VoIP work? And we've been having a conversation with Tim Titus, the CTO of Pass Solutions. And I'd like you to come back for another Twilight Afternoon special. The next one is going to be solving VoIP slash UC drops and clipping problems. See you next time.